Well, Lydia gave me a very interesting introduction, so I've got two lives uh, overall. And uh, so in my professional life, I am the CEO and president of a company called Ten. And what we do is showcase and honor security executives and their project teams that do so on a regional and North America basis. And we've built an amazing community of cybersecurity professionals, uh, bringing together those individuals, your chief information security officers of your major organizations from the private and public sector. We celebrate them. And we also create unique uh, opportunities for the technology companies, the cybersecurity companies, to build those relationships uh, with those individuals and ultimately have an opportunity to do business together. And I've been doing that for a long time. So that's my other life that most people in this, this uh, outfit don't necessarily know about me. Um, I started my company and um, it's a small business uh, and we didn't get a loan from the bank because we're a marketing and events company and uh, we don't have any assets or anything like that. So I have built my company uh, from scratch, have an amazing set of employees. We got, as a live events company, we got through some very difficult times uh, from the other side through the pandemic. So we quickly learned what the digital world was all about. And uh, now we do both digital and in-person events uh, overall. So it's been an amazing journey and um, wouldn't trade it in for anything, but uh, being an entrepreneur and being a CEO of a company uh, has taught me a lot that has been a foundation of how I've made my way into the political world. As Lydia mentioned, I'm very passionate about election integrity. So in 2020, um, we certainly, many of us saw something, said something. I was one of those people in DeKalb County. I was a vote review panelist. And the adjudication um, and the duplication process was entirely different in the presidential primary than it was actually in the general election. Specifically, we, during the primary, uh, we were vote review panels operating in a bipartisan manner under the supervision of an elections uh, manager, director, uh, watching the work that we were doing. So just to give you a perspective, absentee ballots um, are paper-based, as you know, and they have a day in the life of them, and they were partly uh, the main method of voting uh, in the 2020 elections. So those are paper ballots coming in. Uh, they go through the mail system, the drop boxes. They're opened by these massive letter openers. They're sliced in half. Uh, people are paranoid. Um, they cut them in half, you know, cut off the parts of the ballot so they're unreadable. Uh, because for so many of us were at home, they became notepads and they didn't fill them out properly. So the, uh, the vote review panels, in short, had to adjudicate those ballots to determine the voters' intent. There were hundreds of thousands of those ballots. Most of them could not be read by the scanning technology because they were so uh, damaged and um, this couldn't go through. It had to be manually done. So during the primary, just real quick, what we were able to do uh, is work in the letter of the law. Fast forward to the general. Um, because of the volume, that was the excuse they gave us, the vote review panels were not set up in the manner in which were set up in the, in the primary. Uh, the nonpartisans were working in tandem. The bipartisans were working in tandem. When you have a vote review panel, you're supposed to have a Democrat, Republican, and in some instances, because we had a jungle type of um, Senate race going on, the nonpartisan was supposed to work in tandem. Quite frankly, it was totally awry. So I reported that to the Board of Elections. Uh, there were ballots that could be adjudicated or, uh, by the nonpartisan pair that had no locks and controls on them. The duplication process of the damaged ballots and the Yukava military ballots were being done, unfortunately, by election office workers, not by the vote review panels. So the thing was completely awry. Fast forward after the election, um, I was testifying in front of the state senate. I was testifying in front of the state house. I spoke at CPAC. I became incredibly passionate about fitness, faith, integrity, and trust in our elections. I ran for chair of the DeKalb Republican Party, uh, the second bluest county in the state of Georgia, and I got a few bless your hearts. Uh, but it, it is actually refreshing to come up here because there's elected officials where we have one mayor left 
uh, in DeKalb County um, that is a Republican. His name is Frank Allman. He's a great man, but he's the last person standing, so to speak, and our two Board of Elections representatives, which I had the opportunity to appoint, Nancy Jester, who is a former commissioner, and Anthony Lewis. We sat over the last couple of years uh, down at the table with the election office leadership, with Democrats, uh, looked them eye to eye, and said, how we do our elections better uh, and differently that we all could live with and trust? And what was remarkable was we learned a lot. We built a trusted relationships, working relationships. They're not your friends, not being something like that, but what we were able to do is define our processes and procedures. Some examples like poll watching. We have the, one of the longest early voting periods in the entire country. In DeKalb County, it comes out to about 19 days of early voting. Do you know where you're gonna be as a volunteer on day 15 of your early voting cycle? Probably not, right? I mean, some folks cancel today due to illness or other commitments that come up. So what we were able to do is on a weekly basis is submit our poll watcher schedules. That was unheard of, and that's some things that on a statewide basis we can absolutely adopt and encourage in working with all of our election offices. Our vote review panelists, instead of sitting there waiting idle for damaged absentee ballots to come in, the threshold to have them convene is 20 ballots, absentee, damaged absentee ballots. They sit down there for a duration of time, complete the work, any more coming in? Nope, they leave for the day. So it's a lot more efficient and operational. So by sitting down during an off cycle election season, we were able to accomplish a lot. And if you fast forward to our elections uh, in the midterms in 2022, we had a process and procedure if something went wrong, we could escalate it with our board of elections and our election supervisor. Everything was essentially uh, resolved within 24 hours. Um, we didn't have any real major incidents, so a lot of things did go right uh, that a lot of people don't want to talk about moving forward. But we did get blindsided um, this past January. Our Board of Elections representative, Anthony and Nancy, uh, were told by the elections director that they were the recipients of a grant from CTCL, which is Zuckerberg's, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, not organization they put $45 million into our elections here. And that's really what caused a lot of the chaos in our elections because there was no accountability. It was private money. It was spent in a myriad of different ways. There was no controls in place, no checks and balances. Uh, overall, there were no audits, quite frankly. So we didn't know how the money was um, allocated and we certainly didn't know how the money uh, was spent. And there was an imbalance where the blue counties got the lion's share of the money. Some red counties did, but ultimately the bluer counties got that money. So the end of January of this year, uh, we learned we were blindsided. Uh, we were appalled by the fact that the chair of the elections board, who is a Democrat, who is an activist, who said, oh, we bypassed SB 202, our Election Integrity Act. We did that by just working with our finance department who applied for the grant. They did so in May of 2022. They did it in secret. They didn't want to be named, the CFO did not want to be named uh, in that application, but referred his friend over at the elections office supervisor of Clayton County, the number one bluest county, but used my name over there. Claimed that DeKalb County didn't have any money for elections, but wanted for stickers but wanted a building and a car. Fast forward over the series of months, the attorneys on the DeKalb County side, the CTCL attorneys, the COO, CFO of DeKalb County, the elections leadership, on the, you know, the chair, uh, the supervisor, unfortunately worked together and modified the agreement uh, to get this grant. So they deliberately, intentionally circumvented the spirit of SB 202. But how SB 202 is written, a county can receive um, the outside money. And it was fast forward, I sprang into action. Um, and so I was a mama bear, so to speak, in DeKalb County, and reached out to our constitutional officers. I reached out to elected officials. We don't have really elected officials in DeKalb County, <laughs> but 
I reached out to those in our neighboring counties and many of them are our great friends uh, overall. And we got in touch with Max Burns, Senator Max Burns, amazing man. So he championed and sponsored SB 222, went into the Senate hopper on February 21st. Fast forward to March 29th, Sendine, that bill was passed by every single Republican in the General Assembly. They made it a point to be there because it was the Democrats were screaming, kicking and screaming across the board. So when we talk about some of our grassroots with our elected officials in sort of a disconnect right now around the Georgia GOP, every single Republican came to the, came to the operation, came to the mode uh, wanting to stop Zucker Bucks in Georgia. It wasn't a campaign promise on my part. It was simply bringing together over a shared value that we don't want third party money and outside money uh, into the state of Georgia running our elections. It should be done by taxpayer dollars. So I'm very proud of that um, aspect um, overall. And what we've accomplished in DeKalb County, as I mentioned, we're the second bluest county. We put 25 candidates on the ballot in the general or the primary 17 in the uh, in the general we doubled republican voter turnout in this election this last election we increased the margins of victory by tens of thousands of votes so that our constitutional officers did win by actual good amount of mar amount of votes if we make democrats work harder and republicans work smarter we can win when we take back the White House, maybe pick up another constitutional uh, or congressional seat, and maybe we can hopefully keep our major a slim majority that we have down at the Capitol under the Gold Dome. But that's gonna take thinking outside of the box. It's gonna be taking um, working together because we really do need each other to win. I personally rather fight a Democrat any day, I live amongst them, versus a Republican, because again, we need each other to win. And I think if we work together and identify places where Democrats have not had an opponent, have been career politicians, really eroding the communities. I mean, we're hearing up here in Paulding County uh, about people, it's, it's going across the board, right? We're not hearing um, positive news. Our communities are slowly getting affected by fentanyl and other, um, other types of violence. Uh, out there, it, it's going to come here. So we've got to work together to protect our communities, and bring back sanity <laughs> to our lives and our livelihoods because we've really gone off kilter across the board. And if I'm elected as your first vice chair, I would be very honored uh, to, to have that opportunity to bring sanity back and fight those Democrats, not Republicans, and win. Thank you very much.